I think the obvious that uh, when I helped uh, Gene Weinman and uh, Sonny Buffen organize the conference in Atlanta in 2001, I imagine that we had achieved something worthwhile. And then, of course, since then, uh, London, Delft, um, Istanbul, Stockholm, uh, and now here, it's been so much uh, so, so exciting uh, and 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 so uh, so much better than every time than everything that had preceded it that I must say I'm quite amazed and I'm very grateful to the organizers for the tremendous effort and the impeccable organization of, uh, of our conference. It has been really wonderful. Um, the first time I came to Seoul, of course, uh, was not in association with uh, the conference, but in association with the uh, uh, Yongsan competition for the new uh, downtown area uh, just north of the river. And, and it is essentially a project which is still pending, which was about uh, building over uh, uh, railway line terminals. And I couldn't help but, but uh, reminisce about the way in which uh, space indexes impacts on, uh, on urban design uh, started with the uh, project to redevelop uh, uh, King's Cross in London. And just recently I became aware of... Um, uh, statements made in the Norman Foster Complete Works, uh, which are actually so flattering to space syntax uh, that even us space syntax buffs would not have dared make them. And um, not only is there an admission that uh, some element of the project was being referenced as Hillier Way, uh, but also uh, a realization that the King's Cross project was formative for the Norman Foster practice as well as, as, the, as the fact that the Foster and Space Index Final King's Cross Master Plan was a milestone as the first British scheme fully to justify the new enthusiasm for urban design. So you can imagine that landing in Seoul to deal with a similar, situ a similar condition uh, was actually quite an exciting thrill uh, about now, uh, five years ago. Of course, all these projects raise the issue of how one balances uh, vision with uh, pragmatics, and I imagine that's something that will have to be handled uh, over time uh, uh, with Yonsan too. Now, of course, when I think of the city of Seoul, uh, what I find most striking is the way in which uh, different scales of spatial organization uh, are, are so directly and so excitingly interfaced. Uh, scales of speed, scales of experience, and, and, and quite simply scales of accessibility. And it seems to me uh, that if, if, if the locals would allow a tourist to, to make a very superficial comment, uh, the comment would be that Seoul, in my mind, needs to be set up against the tradition of super block design uh, that here, for the sake of indication, do we have a pointer by any chance that I can use? Thank you. Um, on the left, you have the Perry neighborhood plan uh, for, from the 1920s. And just for the sake of uh, exemplification, I multiplied it four times to try to create a supergrid. Uh, next, you have a Shandigar sector designed by Corbu, multiplied again for the sake of illustration. Uh, then you have one of the Islamabad uh, superblocks that exemplifies the Doxiades' principles of acoustics. And then just, again, to, to amuse myself, I took the city of Apt, that was the original uh, exemplification of a deformed wheel, distorted it a little bit, like you see here in double the scale, to try to create a, a supergrid. And what I was actually uh, re reflecting on, uh, just as I was fighting jet lag the other night, is that um, what's exciting in Seoul is, is much more similar to what's going on here. In other words, this sort of abrupt interface of two scales of organizations both of which are deformed wheel-like, versus the far more hierarchical ideas that were expressed in uh, Doxiades, or the sparse development uh, and very uh, uh, sharp distinction, gradual, I beg your pardon, gradual distinctions of scale uh, that were attempted in the earlier days. So that's just a, um, a, a tourist comment on the, on the city host. Uh, let me gradually get to uh, my main uh, business tonight. Uh, um, over the last three years, one of the great pleasures in my uh, research work was the opportunity to work with a team in Minneapolis that studies spatial cognition at the neural level. 
Uh, some of you will remember Apostolos Georgopoulos as a keynote speaker in the Stockholm Conference. Um, that work, um, your space index in the way that is most obvious, as, as a technique that allows you to control the spatial variable in order to deal with the cognitive variables. Uh, our first publication was actually not yet at the neural level. It, it is just uh, using eye fixations as people look at a sample of maps in order to locate a hypothetical city hall, which is another way of saying in order to identify what they think might be the center. And uh, here you see uh, two samples from a male and a female subject as they scan the maps. And the most striking results were actually that uh, men took much longer than women to make the decision, um, comparatively speaking, that men looked at fewer clusters than women, they went to fewer places on the map, that they uh, spread uh, their attention over a larger area per cluster, and that the clusters that they looked at were closer to the center. So what this revealed was two dramatically different ways of scanning maps. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is that obviously, even though it raises exciting questions about cognitive science, uh, the idea being that the end result was equally compelling because from a space syntax point of view, they equally succeeded in identifying high integration spaces, and they were equally uh, biased towards integration. Uh, what's interesting here is that, of course, this sort of work does not take us any closer to design decisions. It takes us closer to certain kinds of insights which are increasingly remote from design. So in, in, in trying to foster this interaction with a team of researchers that, uh, in my mind, are absolutely spectacular in the work they do, I tried to write a paper uh, that expanded on some of the ideas I presented in Santiago, thanks to Margarita Green's invitation. And I'd like initially to summarize these ideas as a first step towards making some additional comments that uh, I've been able to uh, come up with since the publication of this paper, which, by the way, is freely downloadable, if I may self-advertise a little. Um, now, the sample uh, that all this work is based on is a small sample of about 68 buildings. It's actually, by today's standards, a very modest sample. Uh, but they were chosen to represent all kinds of building types and all kinds of uh, size. Uh, these are all obviously drawn to the same scale. Uh, because these buildings were so different in, uh, in mode of subdivision, it made sense to use tessellation analysis uh, from, from depth map, and uh, in particular to look at uh, metric distance from an individual tile going out, and then to color the entire map by the average metric distance to all the tiles, uh, to look at uh, what the area that is visible, and likewise color the map according to the, to the area associated with each individual tile, and to look at the mean number of turns and similarly color the map. Now, um, for all of us uh, frequent uh, depth map users, let me uh, clarify that because here I'm interested in mean turns, I subtract one from what me uh, depth map calls mean depth, because depth map, uh, quite rightly from the point of view of early syntax, calls the tiles that are directly linked to the uh, source tile as lying in depth one whereas I would like to think of them as lying at zero direction changes from the origin, and so I subtract one. So from now on, I'll be using two variables, area, which is simply connectivity multiplied by uh, the square footage of the tile, and here I use tiles of 0.7 meters consistently across the sample. So I'll be referring to area, which is essentially this, and I will be referring to mean turns. I will very deliberately not be using any adjustment from mean turns towards integration. Now let me also remind you um, um, for, uh, uh, what I suggested is pretty fundamental uh, back in Santiago, that, that one way of rethinking, from my point of view, the foundations of syntax is to say that while metric distance works, uh, uh, expands gradually as, as you take steps, uh, visibility can span big distances and remain consistent. So you can have the same visibility value for very many different metric distance values. And it seems to me that that sets up the fundamental dynamic of space, a dynamic between step 
us as a measure of space as we walk versus sight as a measure of space as we look and turn around corners and look again. And um, in many cases, uh, the hot spots from the point of view of uh, purview, how much you can see, are either uh, overlapping or adjacent to the most uh, the spaces we think of as being most integrated. In my ter- in my terminology, the spaces requiring fewer mean turns. So blue in depth map. Now this slide summarizes the the findings of the paper and allow me to go through these findings because they actually uh, describe what I come to think of as the fundamental perceptual interface that it is set up by all buildings. So first, a a few uh, basic, if you like, benchmarks. Uh, In in this particular sample of buildings, the average distance between tiles is 62 meters because I've included some pretty large buildings. But the average number of turns is only 2.5. So buildings don't add all that many turns on average. For 90% of the tiles, uh, the, the, the average number of turns from that tile to all the other tiles in the same building is less than 4.5. So you, you begin to get a sense of an upper limit. Um, as buildings grow larger, of course, distances increase uh, proportionately. But um, the other thing that happens as buildings grow larger is that the maximum uh, uh, purview associated with the tile also goes up. So the larger the building the more you can see from the most panoramic tile. Even though the proportion of the area that you can see goes down with size. So obviously as buildings grow very large, you see a a decreasing proportion of that area. What is interesting though is that as the buildings grow large, so the uh, metric length associated with uh, uh, one visual step is going up. So you walk longer before you have to turn, which is an implicit uh, principle of linearity. Um, In order to pursue the argument further, I then selected at that time uh, the 10% of the most uh, panoramic tiles and asked myself what was the metric as well as turn depth from the nearest panoramic tile. And that was actually extremely low. And not only that, but of course, the more you were shallow to the nearest panoramic tile, the lower your mean depth for the building as a whole. So in essence, uh, that led me to to think of buildings as um, being first and foremost about how you distribute the panoramic tiles. And then if you think of the panoramic tiles as a sort of global structure, what is the depth from those panoramic tiles inward into the uh, uh, primary use spaces. To give you a sense of how these buildings vary, this is a um, simple representation of uh, the, the, the purview. The blue line is the, uh, represents the mean maximum purview for the sample of buildings, about 30 something percent. I cannot see my own slide very well because of the curtain. And the red line is the mean purview full stop for the sample. So you can see that, of course, some buildings have a lot more purview because there are things like churches, but most buildings are sort of uh, uh, clustering right there. But then if you look at mean turns, you can begin to see some very interesting things that mean turns go up, for example, for buildings that we traditionally uh, think of as being complex, like hospitals in red or buildings that we also think of traditionally as being complex, like government buildings uh, in blue. Um, Now, since uh, this is all summarized in the paper and uh, anyone interested can sort of uh, um, take a a more careful careful look. Now, since then, I asked myself the question, um, how can I overcome the arbitrary way in which I decided to call panoramic tiles the 10%? what might have happened if I had chosen 9% or 12%? And obviously that's very unsatisfactory. So I asked myself, is there some more consistent way for splitting the building into a global structure and a local structure? Now, as you know, depth maps uh, coloring is based on essentially a sort of K-means analysis, which essentially asks, 
given a bunch of numbers, how can I sort them into groups by color eventually, such that uh, uh, numbers within one group are as near as possible to, to one another, and groups are as distinct as possible in their intergroup relationship. So you, you, you're essentially trying to decide where, where to put the cutoff points. And you all know from the use of depth map that the cutoff points are put differently depending on the building. Um, that kind of analysis, uh, which is the same, by the way, as the natural breaks in GIS, requires you to pre-specify how many intervals you're looking for. And we tend to specify 10. Uh, the question arises whether you can uh, uh, find some sort of process that allows you to decide not only how to break it for a given number of intervals, but what number of intervals makes best sense. And there is a way to do that, which is known as silhouette analysis. And I'm giving you here the reference to one of the earliest articles. And when you apply silhouette analysis to check any number of clusters between 2 and 30, for 72% of my small sample, for 49 buildings, the optimum way to break connectivity values into clusters is to simply break them in two. So to give you a sense of how this works visually, uh, on the left you have uh, these particular buildings as colored by depth map if you choose connectivity, and on the right the equivalent distinction but with only two clusters after silhouette analysis. I'll just go through a couple of examples, you'll immediately get the hang of it. So obviously I'm choosing the examples to represent courtyards or, or main halls, and then corridors, and then crossing corridors, and now grids. So if you simplify things, the mathematics are more sophisticated, but the outcome is obviously much simplified comparing uh, to the richness of the original depth map output. You basically get to identify what an architect would recognize intuitively as the global structure of buildings. Now, these buildings that I've illustrated here, and I'm, I'm actually being rhetorical, I'm choosing buildings that are deliberately of very simple global structure, grids, let me repeat, crosses, lines, and halls, or courtyards. If you look at where these buildings lie in my overall sample, they tend to lie, they're highlighted in red here, in the lower range of values, of mean depth, mean turn values. Now, these are the basic gestalts of how we sort of organize building circulation. If they go back to people like Tabor or Willoughby or all the early um, uh, sort of spatial morphology, uh, spatial topology analysis from the uh, 1970s. Um, either you have a, a main hall or you have a corridor or a cross or a grid or a, or a spine. Now, if you think about it, even though I actually run these particular examples through depth map to get some value for, for mean turns, which is shown here, you can very quickly intuit what's the upper maximum. So the upper maximum would obviously be by definition zero here. It would be 0.5 as you imagine an extended cross. It would be about 1.5 as you imagine uh, uh, an infinitely extended grid because obviously half the axes are um, uh, one turn away and half are two turns away from any location. And it would be between zero and, and two here, depending on how far you extend the, uh, uh, the sort of transverse uh, uh, part versus the elongation of the, of the horizontal part which tells us that if we just focus on, on the global gestalts, uh, we're not likely to get inside those global gestalts any mean depth value higher, mean turns value higher than 2. And more often, we'll get values between 0.5 and 1.5. So then the, the main depth increment will be from the global structure inward into the main programmatic spaces. So essentially, I'm simply revisiting the distinction of global and local structure. And by global structure, we usually mean skeleton of movement, the, the sort of common cognitive reference. 
And then by local structure in buildings, we tend to refer to the domains of practice or the classes of knowledge that are uh, embodied in, in the building layout. Now, if you look at some of the uh, buildings that look uh, as though they produce a lot more turns, the really complex ones, here are some examples. And so I'd like to make a comment about how we might go into separately quantifying uh, properties of the global structure and properties of the local structure. Now remember, here I'm coloring merely after silhouette analysis on connectivity. So I'm deliberately trying to see how far I can go into understanding buildings without evoking the much more complex uh, idea of integration. Um, I'd like to draw a distinction between two ways in which we might analyze subshapes in buildings. Uh, one obvious way is that you take the subshape that interests you and you extract it in the way that I extracted, for example, a moment ago, uh, gestalt uh, kinds of corridor structures. But the other way that you might want to analyze a subshape is, is by still keeping it embedded in the shape it belongs to. So let me take this hospital, which some of you may, may recognize as the uh, case study in the 1990 paper that uh, Yun Choi and Craig Zimmering and I wrote that sort of started some of the discussion about how space syntax relates to um, path making in buildings. Uh, if you took the uh, global structure, the, the light blue, and you extracted it, the, uh, the, sorry, the depth between this chunk of corridor and that chunk of corridor would be something like one turn, two turns, three turns, four turns, five turns, six turns. So in an extracted subshape analysis, there would be a, quite a considerable turn distance between this chunk of corridor and that, and that chunk of corridor. In an embedded subshape analysis, I would like to keep the distance from this chunk of corridor to that chunk of corridor as zero. So the idea with embedded subshape analysis is that you still are working uh, uh, with the entire building pr uh, plan in the background. Now, if we were able to do embedded subshape analysis, which, parenthesis, I think would be a very, a very useful thing to have, imagine, for example, how it would facilitate when you're dealing with offices to look at the relationships between workstations uh, without taking into account uh, the library or the coffee room or the sort of auxiliary spaces. So back to my argument, if we were able to implement embedded subshape analysis, then we would be able to see that even if you keep the, uh, uh, the panoramic tiles embedded, there would actually be quite considerable mean depth uh, within the, the panoramic structure of this building, which might go some way towards quantifying why it is that this building is cognitively complex, why it is that our subjects had so much trouble finding destinations. And, and the yardstick would be the comparison of the embedded mean depth of the global structure against the gestalt models that I showed earlier. And that would be one quantification of simple complexity. And then the other would be what's the distance, uh, either in terms or metric, to the nearest panoramic tile. So you would have a decomposition of the total depth into some total depth that has to do with the configuration of the panoramic system, and then the other component that has to do with uh, moving out from that panoramic system. And that would begin to make sense of various kinds of complexity. Some complexities that have to do with simply having to fragment circulation because you're operating within a restricted site. This is a very large uh, uh, ground floor of a hospital versus the kinds of complexity that might have to do more with um, the application of social knowledge the way in which in the Viceroy's house in, in Delhi, Lichens creates wings that are very intelligently made to be segregated. So that the very fact that you have the grand entrance and then the deep core is actually pushing some of the uh, pavilions uh, into more mean, mean turns. 
Um, here you have uh, two buildings that are essentially about lots of people getting together in the same space. Um, the Philharmonie in Berlin, at least uh, one floor, and the ground floor of Scottish Parliament. And what's interesting here is, first of all, they work not on the principle of an elongated uh, structure of panoramic tiles, but on the principle of clusters. And secondly, and very consistently with our social expectations, there's actually quite a complicated path uh, from uh, one main cluster to another, something like seven turns between the lobby of members of parliament and the lobby of the public and the journalists at the ground floor of Scottish Parliament. So that if we were able to do embedded uh, analysis of the mean turns associated with the, the global tiles, we, we would find uh, quite a high value, considerably higher than our gestalt's, and that would immediately be interpretable in terms of the deliberate intent to create those separations for programmatic reasons. So uh, I'm essentially suggesting that um, we can explain to some extent what's going on with uh, mean depth, which has been the variable of uh, prime interest, by looking at the distribution of a much simpler variable, uh, connectivity, the area which is seen, but doing this in a slightly more systematic way. And I'm also suggesting that, that in a way, the added uh, routine of silhouette analysis allows things to come back to intuition even more powerfully. Now, I don't mean to imply that the subtle discriminations that depth map colors into the maps are of no interest, quite on the contrary, because along a corridor, you may, of course, as Gene Weinman was arguing just yesterday, you may have different rates of encounter depending on, on where you are. And so the 10 colors that depth map uses uh, are, are responding to these functionally very important differentiations. But from a cognitive point of view, from the point of view of simplifying the orientation skeleton of a building, those distinctions do not matter. And, and when uh, architects design buildings, of course, what they primarily orient themselves to is the global intelligibility of the building. So to some extent, I'm suggesting that we need to rethink foundations, rethink uh, th our theory of measures in relation to rethinking effects. And I'm um, schematizing here some of the foundations and some of the effects I have been interested in as I essentially attempted to present to my colleagues in cognition a very Hilarian theme, how might we consider buildings as cognitively relevant data? What might be the basic parameters in which a cognitive scientist might be interested in what buildings have to say about the human mind? I'm obviously uh, echoing some of the questions that Bill has asked about cities. Uh, in 2005. Um, okay. Now, uh, because this conference has been so exciting and because during some of your wonderful presentations, I, like you, were able to also think laterally, uh, I've, I've come up with a few more steps in the argument that I will dare present. And, and those have to do with a question that uh, Kirsten Saylor asked me in Santiago. Uh, how do you link any theory of intelligibility to the sort of uh, theory of social function. And it seems to me uh, that the link has to be through more carefully looking at this notion of interface and thinking of it both in terms of perception, the interface between panoramic and, and, and more constricted locations, and in terms of cognitive relations, the interface between something like an emerging skeleton uh, and uh, the, the main activity spaces, and also, of course, in social terms. So it's a matter maybe of unpacking the idea of interface a little bit. Now, quite evidently, um, buildings are all about subdivision, and so essentially they're at, at the simplest level about how you, you move from the notion of one object, the elementary object in the social logic of space, to some sort of uh, composition of many, right? Uh, inherently that's how buildings are because they are subdivided. 
And what we've typically done is that we've rushed into understanding sequences of movement or circulation alternatives, and then sought to relate these to, depending on whose work you read, uh, relations of power, as in the admirable work of Tom Marcos right since the 80s, uh, relations of control, as in lots of work of people in the audience, uh, including also some of the older work of people like uh, Dita Petros, and then relations of classification, as in the work of all of us, uh, Sofia Psara, uh, certainly very prominently, uh, who, who have analyzed museum spaces. So that's the sort of operation that we've engaged. Um, now let me revisit this issue of how we move from one to many for a minute. Uh, one way we do it is simply by expanding uh, some sort of central space. So whether you, you have uh, an elementary building or the other generative uh, form, the sort of courtyard with rooms around it, this is the Tholos of the Agora in Athens, and this is the, the house in, in Zillos, uh, you can, of course, the first thing you can do is simply scale it up. Uh, these are all to the same scale, Pantheon and, and Farnese Palace in Rome. Now, we all know that scaling things up has a limit. Uh, you, you sort of soon reach the limit of what is possible. Uh, you, you then may begin to do combinations, like juxtapose two uh, sort of uh, hall-like spaces or courtyard spaces, um, and thus expressing a fundamental duality of program. Uh, the cloisters versus the church, the backstage versus the front stage, the public lobby versus the uh, members of parliament lobby. But that sort of way of moving from the elementary to the complex is obviously very constricted. It, it still applies admirably to some major innovations of the 20th century, like the multi-story atrium in Portman Hotels. Uh, what, what is far more relevant to the general case is the way in which we handle elongation. And that primarily is a property of shape that uh, needs to be absorbed into the foundations of syntax. Now, lots of people, again, amongst you, I'm obviously thinking of Ermal Spuza because I simply come from Georgia Tech, but lots of us have actually asked how does shape interact with, um, with syntax. If you take it down to its bare simplest, when you move from a compact building to an elongated building, as, as the transition from the architecture of the Tholos to the architecture of a Stoa, this particular one, Stoa Vasilios, what you're actually doing, I think, the first thing elongation does is to actually differentiate the boundary. Not simply differentiate it in terms of access versus limit, threshold, but to differentiate it in terms of a long and a short face. By definition, that's what elongation does. And so that gives rise to two ways of playing. Either you interface along the long face, in which case I think the effect of elongation is to create a more egalitarian space, a space of, of greater distribution, or you're playing the short face and then elongation essentially increases distance. Now, if you take the long face and attach things to it, you sort of create uh, a distributed interface, as in the rather large Stoa Atalos in the Agora of Athens. There is one more alternative that we're very familiar with, which is the sort of stringing of rooms along a line so that the elongation is not a space in its own right, but an emergent structure. So uh, you, you may think of this as cross elongation, and of course, that creates manifest depth, not depth associated with turning around corners, but depth associated primarily with occlusion along the visual field. And these are three uh, very fundamental ways in which uh, elongation plays out. And if you accept that argument, then you can begin to rationalize the fundamental difference between matrix plans versus corridor plans. Both are grids. But uh, uh, what, what Robin Evans and many others call the matrix plan, exemplified here by the National Gallery, is essentially playing this, the uh, cross elongation in two dimensions, whereas the typical corridor plan plays this in two dimensions. 
Okay, so th that fundamental uh, compositional distinction can be brought into the purview of uh, of what we're discussing. Um, so basically, um, uh, I'm basically suggesting that elongation may either work in ways that make buildings uh, more democratic in, in equalizing uh, a lot of local interfaces along a single uh, a single route a single panoramic system or it may work by um, essentially both defining and challenging uh, the distinctions that come from adding depth so that's the fundamental difference between uh, this and uh, a labyrinth, where the addition of depth by being dissociated from elongation uh, of panoramic tiles uh, obviously creates uh, confusion, and that's that's the intent. So that essentially brings me to to the end of a rather simple argument, um, and I'd like to recognize that the argument is very analogous to the rather admirable argument Bill made in 2002 when he started with the observation that uh, there is a logarithmic distribution of uh, street lengths in cities and that there are very few very long streets and very many quite short streets and that one way to characterize the typology of cities was to actually recognize that the long streets create some sort of super system and that the short streets are infills and he also suggested that the uh, super system of, of long streets plays two functions. First of all, it organizes intelligibility, a, an argument that he pursued by comparing actual cities to theoretical cities that he could generate without having the variations of street length. So on the one hand, the, the strategic distribution of long streets, he argued, was enhancing intelligibility. On the other hand, he also argued that inherently the strategic distribution of long streets was associated with those land uses that are more interactive, including but not limited to retail. And so essentially, and I, I'm realizing this after the fact, uh, I'm essentially producing a very parallel argument about buildings where I'm substituting uh, depth map connectivity in other words, purview for street length, and I'm substituting depth from that uh, for uh, Bill's sort of residential areas. But if, I, if I'm to point back, uh, uh, which is a tendency of old people to sort of like to reminisce, I would also reminisce about a very early attempt uh, that, that some of us made in, in the 80s to put some numbers to the foundational intuition in space syntax that the colors that back then were produced by Nick Dalton's axman, um, that those colors on the axial map are distributed according to different configurations, the red colors. And, and the way that we tried to describe it then was to distinguish between the spread of an integration core, how far out does it reach, and the strength of the integration core, how, how far more together the integration core is relative to the depth from it. So to some extent, um, I'm revisiting uh, both uh, fully stated recent foundations, those by Bill in uh, 2002, and some much more weakly stated intuitions of some of my work uh, in, in the 80s. And with that, I'll finish. Rather than ask for questions, I'd like to invite any kind of comment, including what rubbish. <laughs> I cannot see very well, so... This is me, Yes. Uh, this is great, fascinating. Uh, I was wondering, shouldn't you also look at both of these things together, the city and... The city and buildings and try to kind of develop the same sort of rhetoric for uh, a combined uh, architecture plus urban context sort of thing because you know some of these buildings are freestanding and we understand you know, authorizing 
circle. But if you look at Agora, for instance, uh, it's got a context that should be seen with what is there in the core as well. So maybe you can construct the same sort of argument for, for both of them together. Maybe. I haven't done it yet. Uh, it, it would be worth trying, I'm sure. I, I, I don't know what, what to say, Kevin, because obviously uh, I'm operating from the um, um, understanding that um, there is a fundamental discontinuity between buildings and cities, which has to do with the fact that cities are primarily about continuous space, and buildings, we, we used to think, are prim primarily about uh, uh, subdivided, discontinuous space. And, and so initially, it seems to me useful to keep that distinction intact. Uh, but there may be very, very fruitful conclusions to reach by also looking at them in conjunction. I haven't done it yet. Alan? Closure of urban space, and he was noticing this phenomenon um, in which urban space is increasingly enclosed for engaging communities. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, if we go to <coughs> China at the moment and have a look at shopping malls, these are amazing internal buildings um, which are very open. And so I think the, the future of architecture and the future of urbanism, these, the boundaries between the enclosure and openness. Uh, well, as I said in my previous response, it's not something I've pursued, Alan. Uh, but um, if that's the case, uh, for for uh, an an old guy who is is thinking of the old foundations of space syntax, uh, it, it would call us to to question the foundations of society. As, as we've understood it, because the traditional way in which we think of the social is this distinction between the public realm, uh, if not public, legally speaking, at least the social realm of, of mixture, and the realm of program. And so if that distinction was to be cancelled, if the private and the public were to be merged spatially and therefore institutionally, that would imply to me uh, a fundamental shift in the definition of the social. Now, I, I've never been to China, and so I don't have any comment to make about a country and a culture about which I'm entirely ignorant, but I do live in Atlanta. And, and had this been occurring in Atlanta, I would worry that it is the ultimate extension of a situation which, where you don't invest in the commons, but you invest in various discretized transpatial solidarities. And so, yes, you open up the building, provided the building is in the upmarket neighborhood, which is safely distant from uh, the equivalent of uh, the decaying neighborhoods. Uh, and so I would, I, I would need to reflect, but my initial dinosaur's reaction is to worry, not to be immediately happy. Uh, with such fundamental transformations. I would need to think it through. Erma? This was a very nice one. Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating work. Um, I'm, I'm sort of quite intrigued and uh, from the fact that you emphasize size in your sample. You talk about small things and big things. And uh, keeping in mind the argument that buildings are networks between spaces, and they are product of networks between people, just like cities. And that uh, sort of uh, basic argument about uh, analyzing the environment according to biological models that uh, look at the organisms also as networks where size becomes quite important. And I'm, I'm sort of looking at what the, the possibility of further uh, extension where uh, because uh, area, in this case, grows in a different order from depth, as you know, consider how that uh, organ network or skeleton, uh, that minimal system, 
we're doing a different order with, uh, from the way the cashing area visibility goes. If you were to consider the effect of size between small to large buildings, it would be a very useful step to develop this and, and absolutely uh, like the suggestion. It would be a very useful step to take this as foundation and then refine it. But um, having been at the game for all these years, I am now, as, again, as I, um, as I th uh, look at things, I'm, I'm actually more interested in the question, how far can I go without refinements? Because to some extent, design intuitions and the fundamental syntactic decisions made in design occur at an intuitive level. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very explicitly saying yes to your suggestion. It would be wonderful. But for instance, I could also have answered, yes, my correlations are between the square root of area and the logarithm of turns. And maybe that gives me a hint, the fact that it is logarithmic, that there may be some allometric relation but I don't see the immediate gain I would get by identifying one or more allometric patterns, either one for all buildings or maybe several by type, those that grow as grids versus those that, that grow as fish bones versus those that grow as some other principle. That refinement would be intellectually very elegant from the point of view of writing a report, but I'm not immediately sure what it would give me in terms of gut intuition about how to design or in what directions to aim the design. But I'm, I'm, I'm saying, yes, absolutely, that would be a very elegant next step. Sophia? Thanks for fascinating presentation. And my question is very simple. I think I enjoyed a lot the rethinking interface and the rethinking uh, shape and uh, the organization of the material. I wonder whether you have thought of uh, looking at these issues from the point of view of different building types and start seeing whether you can... Well, obviously I've thought about it and that I started um, coloring my histograms by, sorry, by building type. I don't have enough representative of each, representatives of each type, but again, um, going to foundations, which is my intent. I mean, as you may remember from Santiago, I, I'm, I'm, I'm basically giving myself the challenge and I wish I had Bill's help even more. How, how does one move from chapter three back to chapter two? So um, in terms of basic intuitions, either we take the view that one becomes specialized by function type, hospitals versus schools versus whatever it is, or we take the view that there are underlying generators of built form that respond to the generic functions. The generic function of interest to me is primarily intelligibility because of that collaboration I mentioned. I do take the view that, that space syntax is primarily about the generic functions, but yes, if, if I had the ability to extend my sample from uh, 68 buildings to 400 buildings, which I actually will try to do, then I could explore your question uh, much better as I could explore Alan's question much better. Because yes, I suspect, for example, that if you take the metaphor of the street, which is a way of playing up the, the linear extension, uh, of, of the panoramic tiles. Of course, the metaphor of the street is different than the SAS building that Grajewski talked about back in the uh, early 80s, uh, than it is uh, in a school uh, building that operates with the street metaphor. So I appreciate that. But again, if our concern is to take our parametric findings, and those parametric findings are obviously driven by building types, we do a, a doctoral thesis on museums, and, and then we spent four years on a funded research project on, on offices, on, um, on offices, yes. Even though our uh, research findings tend to be by building type, I think the underlying intuitions about generators have to come back to, to principles. Thank you. Final.